All right. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is on page 108, number 6, and then 8 to 12. This deals with what's called the ambiguous case of the sign law. Um, what it means is that you're given information, and I'm actually going to remove one of the sides of this construction. What you're given is an angle and the length of two sides but the angle is not between the two sides. So typically speaking, I'll give you, maybe it's best to just deal with a specific example. I might tell you that this is 35 degrees, and I might tell you the length of the side right next to it that's in red is 20 centimeters, and then I might tell you the length of this other side, which you know needs a bit of tweaking to form a triangle. It needs to be adjusted, but if I told you that this was... 17 centimeters, the question becomes how many triangles can you form? And I might as well run the gamut here of looking at all four possibilities. You know, the question is if it's 17, how many different triangles are there? If it's 8, How many different triangles are there? And I'm not going to redraw that line so that it looks 8. I'm just going to say it's 8. You have to decide for yourself how you're going to cope with that. Uh, on the other hand, we could have... I regret choosing 35 degrees. I'm going to change it to 30 degrees. How many of you see why I want to use 30 degrees? It gives a height that's a nice number, right? I was going to just go to a calculator and calculate what the height is here, but... Um, it's going to be decimals, and we're going to have an awkward moment of trying to explain what's going on on your calculator. I want it to be exactly a certain number. So this is 30. This is 30. So the question is, if it's 17, if that side across from the 30 degrees is 17 centimeters, how many different triangles can you have? If, on the other hand, that side across is 8, how many can you have? If that side across from the 30 is exactly 10, how many can you have? And if that side across from the 30 degrees is 24, how many can you have? And I'm just curious, by a show of hands, how many of you understand without a doubt that there are no triangles possible here? doesn't even require much thought. The reason is, is that dangling side is going to be less than the height. If you were to calculate the height of that triangle, which I'm going to highlight in blue, if you were to calculate this height, well, we can calculate it. Looking at the blue triangle, looking at the blue triangle, I can use sine of 30 degrees equals opposite, which is the height of the triangle, over hypotenuse, which is 20. So the height is 20 sine 30. And because you've been taught that the sine of 30 degrees is exactly a half, whether you remember it or not is a different story. But because you're taught it's a half, that means that this height is 10. So there are no triangles here because 8 is less than 10. I hope many of you understand that in this particular case, there will be one triangle, and it will be a right triangle, because that hanging side or dangling side is exactly equal to the height. If I were to swing it around without changing its length, it would connect with the bottom of the triangle in one place. I hope many of you understand that you're going to get two triangles here. One triangle is formed when that dangling side first connects with the base, creating a, an angle in the bottom right corner of the triangle that's less than 90, but if you keep going, it's going to connect with the base in a different place, making that angle in the triangle more than 90. And finally, I hope you can appreciate that there would be one triangle here, but it would not be a right triangle because that dangling side is more than the 20. So without getting into the A, B, C thing, trying to make it more general, 
the reason why here you have two triangles. You have two triangles because 17 is smaller than 20 but bigger than the height of 10. I mean, I guess I could put 10 there. I just would want to include it in this diagram to make sure you know what I mean. That's why there's two triangles. In this case, there are zero triangles because that dangling side, which I think the way I taught it to you, that was always A, right? Is that right? I think it was. That dangling side of A is smaller than the height of 10, so you can't form a triangle. Here, there's one right triangle because that 10 equals the height. This is A, and it's equal to the height. And here, there's one triangle because that 24 is greater than or equal to the other side. If that, if that dangling side is equal to the other side or bigger than the other side, you're going to get one triangle. That's what this is all about. The rest of it is using your calculator to calculate angles. Uh, does anybody have any questions you would like me to go over? Go ahead. 11? 11? This is a really good illustration of the calculation aspect to the ambiguous case of the sign law. Um, the Canadian Coast Guard Pacific region is responsible for blah, 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 blah. So really, that first sentence, there is uh, zero information in that first sentence that I believe is responsible, that I believe is helpful in this question. The fact that it's 27,000 kilometers of coastline and 27,000 is a number doesn't mean it has anything to do with the question. It could also you know, give the captain of the boat that person's height. doesn't mean we're going to use it. Um, the rotating spotlight from the ship can illuminate a total distance up to 250 meters. What this means is, and, and I think you kind of get the idea here, if you're driving at night and it's a little bit foggy, you, you can really notice this. Your headlights will light up the road. It doesn't even have to be foggy. But even though I might be driving through Saskatchewan, and I'm on a very, very straight road, and my headlights are on, that doesn't mean it's lighting up the road a mile away. It only lights up a certain distance. And they're saying the distance is 250 meters. So what we have here is a beam of light that hits the shore there. And that, that beam of light is on a little rotating thing. And it rotates. So this is spinning around. But the only problem is it can't light up the ground over here because this maximum distance is always 250. So I hope you understand that this is like our dangling side. And it will connect here to form a triangle from the observer to that point where the light hits. And then this is going to sweep in this direction and it will be lighting up. I better do it this way. It will be lighting up the shore everywhere here. But as soon as this line passes point A, I'm assuming it's rotating clockwise in my diagram, then this will not be lit up. So if this were a prison spotlight and you were you know, trying to escape from the prison by getting against the wall, you'd be fine over here. You'd be fine over here. You'd be fine over here. But you wouldn't be fine anywhere here. So that's the setup. Now the question is, what's that distance? What is the length of shoreline illuminated by the spotlight? So what we're going to do here, everybody, and this is a really good, I think this is a really good written response question, is we're going to look at two triangles. Well, there's lots of ways to do it. I'm going to look at this triangle. I'm 
We're going to look at the yellow triangle. And that will allow me to find this distance. The distance from the observer to point D. Then what I can do is use, uh, there's lots of things you can do here. I'm going to use now this triangle There's other things we could do now that I think about it, but I've already started this, so I'm going to walk down this road and see what happens. We can use that triangle to find the distance from the observer to A, and then we can subtract those two distances. So in... Give me a second to prepare this. In this triangle, we know that this is 250, this is 20 degrees, and this is 500. That's enough for us to find anything else out about that triangle because we have an angle pair, an angle side pair. I can find out this angle using the sine law. Then once I know that angle, I can determine this angle. I'm going to call it beta using the sine law. And then once we figure out what beta is, I can find this distance, which I've called OD using the sine law. If you knew the cosine law, there might be a quicker, slicker way of getting to the answer here, but we don't. So let's go through the motions here and see what happens. I can write sine of 20 degrees over, this should be 250, right? My brain skipped a beat there over 250 meters equals 500, whoops, equals sine of theta over 500. Uh, you want to be very careful here, and I don't know if anybody's noticed this, but 250 is exactly half of 500. That doesn't mean the angle is going to be twice as great or anything. Trigonometry doesn't work that way. So I'm, I'm at the stage now, everybody, in this course where I should be able to say to you, solve for theta. And, and everybody should be almost at the stage where you don't even need to write anything down here to find out what theta is. I'm going to take 500 times sine of 20 degrees. Just do a quick mode check. Divided by 250. And then I take the inverse sine of that answer, and I get this angle. So this is 43 degrees. I can easily find what I've labeled as angle beta now, because I know two of the three angles in the triangle. So I can take the 43 plus the 60, which gives me, sorry, I can take the 43 plus the 20, which gives me 63. So. It must be 127. I, I don't know. Am I off by 10 degrees again? 117? Really? OK. Man, I can't, I can't fix that part of my brain. Uh, and if you want to carry all your decimals, you can. But I'm just going to write down 117 here. And now I'm back into the sine law mode. So I can say that side OD over sine of the 117 equals 250 over sine 20 degrees. The reason why I wasn't too picky about writing down the exact value is I know it's on my calculator, so I can carry all my decimals here. What do I need to do? I need to take. 250 times that, times sine of that, 
and divide by sine of 20. So we know that total distance along the bottom is 652 meters. OK, well, that's a start. Don't forget we're finding that because if that's 652 meters, and we determine what this distance is in meters, we can subtract them. So now what we're going to do, and this is interesting, now what we're going to do is look at the other triangle. And the other triangle is this one. Now, what you would normally do is the same thing we did for the first triangle, which would be to say, you would say this is 250, uh, this is 500, this is 20 degrees, and you would work on finding this angle using the sine law. But I know what this angle is. And the reason I know what that angle is is because I've already determined that this is 43 degrees. And this, this illustrates the idea behind the ambiguous case of the sine law that when you have two triangles, that one angle you find, your calculator will spit out the one less than 90, but the other angle that your calculator never occurs to tell you will be 180 minus that first angle we found. In other words, this is the 43 degrees we found, which was angle B in the first triangle. Angle B in the second triangle is this angle, and those two have to add up to 180. There's no way for you on your calculator to get, let's get it out of the way first, 180 minus 43 is 137? Yes, it's 137 degrees. There's no way for you to go inverse sine on your calculator and expect it to spit out 137. What you would do here, if you wanted to find Angle B, which is theta, is you would do this exact same thing that we did with the other triangle, right? And what's your, tr what's your calculator tell you? It tells you 43 degrees. But you have to be savvy enough to know that if this is bigger than 90, the angle is actually going to be 180 minus that angle your calculator spits out. So now what we're dealing with, I can't believe I forgot it, 137? 137 is this situation, and now, in order to find out this distance, which is OA, we can figure out what the missing angle is first and get 23 degrees by adding them up and taking the total out of 180. So it's 23. There are some decimals here involved, but my, I think my job right now primarily is not about carrying all those decimals. It's about answering your question. So now in the second triangle, everything above this line is the first triangle. In the second triangle, I can write OA over sine 23 equals 250 over sine 20 degrees solve for OA, then take it away from the 652 meters to give us the distance of the shoreline. So 250 sine 23 divided by sine of 20 gives me 285 or 286 roughly meters. 
285.6. And you can see that this thick red line, I'm just highlighting it in case somebody's watching this on video later, is the difference between the 652 and the 286. And that will give you the answer. Are there other ways you could have done this? Yes. I, I mean, it occurred to me very early on that there's maybe a simpler approach. And it's that basically now that triangle in the middle where this is 250 and this is 250, you can break into two right triangles and once we've determined this, help, 43? Once you've determined this is 43 degrees, you could simply use regular run-of-the-mill Sokotoa with the right angle triangle to determine this and then double it to determine the length of the shoreline that's lit up as the light sweeps around. Any other questions? All right, so please open up your books to the next lesson, which is on the cosine law. Say it again. Do you have a calculator charger that I can plug in? I do. I, I'll plug it in for you. Not the prettiest thing, but it'll it'll do for now. All right, so we are looking today at the cosine law. And a couple of notes here, just as a general introduction. We learned that you can use the sine law as long as you know a quote side angle pair. What does that mean? It means you know the length of a side and the angle across from it. And as long as you know one other piece of information, then you can find the missing half of the other pair. But you have to know A and A or B and B or C and C, capital C and lowercase c. But if you have a triangle in which you know all three sides, so if you have a triangle in which you know all three sides, that is to say you know this, you know this, and you know this, the triangle has particular angles. If I gave you a piece of wood that was 8 centimeters long and another one that was 7 centimeters long and another one that was 6 centimeters long, and I said, make a triangle, you'll all get the same triangle. Now, some of yours may be mirror images, like they might be kind of flipped over, but the angles are going to be the same. Um, the angle between the two longest sides is going to be the smallest angle. And it doesn't matter how you put it together, you'll get that angle. So this is what we refer to as a side, side, side situation. On the other hand, if I give you two sides, so you know these two sides, and you know the angle in between them, and you, know, you can do the same thought experiment. If I gave you a piece of wood that was 10 centimeters long and one that was 4 centimeters long, and I said they have to connect together with an angle of 20 degrees in between, the opposite side, the third side is determined, isn't it? There's no, there's no decision about that. And that means that knowing those three things, that's enough information for you to solve the triangle. And this is what we refer to as side angle side. Generally speaking, when you use the sine law, you know two sides and the angle not between them, generally speaking. Because that would mean that this side 
and this angle are a side angle pair. Right? I mean, you can also use the sine law if you know a side and two angles. But that's generally the case. When you take a look at these two triangles that definitely have predetermined values for everything else based on what I've given you, which means the triangles, which means these three angles depend on those three sides. Those three sides determine those angles. When you take a look at either of these triangles, you do not know an angle side pair. You don't. I mean, you don't even know any angles here. And here, the angle you know does not match with the side in terms of known information. You don't know a side that's across from it. So my only point in this getting to be a lengthy discussion is that's when you use the cosine law. And the cosine law is a little more complicated than the sine law. We give you the cosine law in two forms. So to begin with, I want to talk about this form of the cosine law. And it, it looks confusing, but it's not. I would like to point out to you that this A in this equation is being used all the time to determine the missing side. Whenever you use that a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos c, sorry, 2ab cos c, whenever you use that, you're finding the missing side. And what that means is that the other two sides, the two sides that the angle is between, must be b and c. And the angle must be angle A. So now looking at this formula, you can see that to find side A, you need to know the other two sides and the angle across from it. And, and I want to point out to you that we're going to very quickly diverge away from A, B, and C. Because if I gave you the following triangle, and said find x, there's no a, b, or c. But look at the cosine law in your notes right now. And, and you're going to have to you know, swap your attention between that and what's up here. The cosine law that I've highlighted, this one, is to find a missing side. So we would put missing side squared equals. Now what's next in the cosine law? The square of b plus the square of c. That just means 12 squared plus 10 squared. It's the square of the other sides. It's, all, it's just so close to being the Pythagorean theorem, but it isn't. And then what's the next part in the cosine law? Minus 2bc. Well, that's 2 times 12 times 10. Cosine angle A. That's 70 degrees. This is almost a, a rhythmic thing. Square the other sides subtract 2 times the, the product of the other sides times the cosine of the angle between them. By the way, I forgot my squared here on the 12. By the way, this means 12 squared plus 10 squared minus 2 times 12 times 10 times cosine of 70. It doesn't mean you're going to take 12 squared and add 10 squared and then subtract 2 times 12 times 10 and then multiply by the cosine of the angle. Okay. Order of operations says you multiply first. So let's take a look at an example. Number one, why can we not use the sine law to find the length of side BC, also known as side A, in this triangle? The answer is we lack a side angle pair. The sine law, you need a side and an angle that, that form a pair. 
And I, I know you know what that means, but I'll repeat it. It means that the angle is across from that side. They're across from each other. So use the cosine law to determine side A. Well, I've set this one up so that it matches the cosine law to a T. But again, it doesn't have to. We put the numbers in. Um, this is C. This is B. Uh, I hope you understand it doesn't matter really which one you call B and which one you call B and C. I mean, I know one is B and one is C, but if you happen to switch B and C by mistake, you're going to get the same answer. So we're going to have A squared equals B squared, which would be 10.4 squared, plus C squared, which is 21.9 squared, minus 2 times B, which is 10.4, times 21.9, that's C, times the cosine of angle A. And I just noticed I do have a typing mistake, or not a typing, a writing mistake here. How many of you see what I wrote wrong? What is it, Lucas? Right, I forgot the C, and I think that's because I started writing C, and then I went, oh, cos. But there should be a C wedged in between the B and the cos A. And this is, by the way, why we very frequently with the cosine law write capital C for cos, I think. Um, we're pretty much done here. I mean, not yet, but we can put this into our calculator. 10.4 squared plus 21.9 squared. I, I, that's how I'm entering squared. You could hit the square key. Minus 2 times 21.9 times 10.4 cos 47. Now, there you go. I just I entered the B and C in the different order than there. I have them written down. But before I hit enter and finish off this problem, I need you to understand two very common errors, and I catch myself making them. One is to put plus instead of minus. I, I don't know why it's a common mistake. I remember a couple of years ago I was teaching, and I got through the whole lesson, and I was going plus, and I knew it was minus. The other common mistake is forgetting about that two. It's really easy to forget that two. 10.4 uh, squared, I'm just double-checking my entry, 29.4. 21.9 squared minus 2 times the product of those cos 47. I hit equals. Now, this is not side A. That's A squared, right? A squared equals 277.1. I better just double check. Anybody else getting 277.1? Hopefully you are. So that means I have to take the principal square root of it. What do I mean by principal square root? I mean, I'm not worried about negatives here. I get 16.6. So A equals 16.6. I guess it's centimeters because everything was in centimeters. Technically, it's plus or minus, but we're finding lengths, and lengths are never negative. Any questions with B? All right. In this triangle, we have side A is 11, side B is 5, angle C is 20. So before we sketch the diagram, look at that list of three items. You're given side A, side B, and angle C. Do you see that angle C has to be between sides A and B? So, I mean, if we draw this, we can demonstrate that. Uh, it doesn't really matter how we draw it. This is A equals 11. Well, it doesn't matter how we draw it. It doesn't matter the orientation of our diagram. I could have drawn A to be a vertical line. Uh, B is 20 degrees in between A, and it's only 5, so maybe a better picture of the diagram would be that.
I mean, if the bottom of this triangle is 11, then 5 is about half of that. So looking at this, and I hope that many of you wouldn't need to do this to answer the question, what's, the, what's this angle? This is angle C. Because across from side B is angle B. Across from side A is angle A. This question now is no different than the one we just did. So I would like everybody to apply the cosine law to this and get an answer. And I know that many of you could probably just do it on your calculator, but I would like you to write it down. Is that better? Okay, so rookie mistake. I can't believe I did that. In this question, we knew A. We were not trying to find A. We were trying to find C. Strangely enough, I bet most of you got the answer to the question anyway, right? Okay. Um, so now we know side C. We're asked to solve this triangle. Okay. Now, I'm going to work on finding angle B first. And I have to use the sine law. Okay. I, I don't have a cosine law formula yet. I'm going to explain it to you to find an angle. But I'm going to use the sine law to find angle B. And I can write sine of B over 5 equals sine of 20 over that 6.5 that we found. I'm going to cross multiply and solve for B. So I need to take 5 times sine of 20, and then I need to divide by my answer of the 6.5, whatever it was. And then I need to take the inverse sine. So angle B is a puny 15.2 degrees. So I'm going to write my numbers up here in green for the answers. We've got 6.5 approximately. We have 15 degrees approximately. So to find this angle now, angle A is really easy. Okay. We're going to go 180 and subtract the 35 and get 145. Yeah, I'm going to go to the nearest degree and just say 145. Now, how many of you understand if you use the sine law to find angle B here, you wouldn't get the right answer? Let's just try it. Don't write this down. But what if, or sorry, angle A. If you use the sine law to find angle A, you wouldn't get the right answer. Don't write this down, but what if you had said, I'm going to find angle A. You would have put sine of A over 11 equals sine of 20 over 6.5. So on your calculator, find angle A from this. I keep saying angle, no, angle A. Yeah, Find angle A from it. So I guess I'm going to go 11 sine 20, divide that by 6.5, and take the inverse sine of the answer, and we get 35 degrees. But the angle is 100 and 45. This is the ambiguous case of the sine law. It's actually 180 minus 35 is the answer. And I'm going to tell you right now, you would never realize that. If you use the sine law to find an angle that's bigger than 90 and you don't know it's bigger than 90, you're hooped. You get the wrong answer. Let's move on now, and now we're going to look at the second form of the cosine law, and then I'm going to go back and look at example two, and we're going to find angle A using the cosine law instead of the sine law. So what does the second form of the sine, uh, cosine law say? If you look at it on your formula sheet, it says cosine of the angle equals B squared plus C squared minus A squared over 2BC. 
what this second formula is, everybody, is this formula that I've highlighted rearranged for cosine of A. If I take this entire term here, which is negative, and I move it across the equal sign, I get 2BC cos A. On the other side, I'm going to have B squared plus C squared minus A squared. So if I divide both sides by 2BC, I get this formula. I hope that everybody realizes in the blue formula that's highlighted, these two sides are the sides that you know, and the other side is the one you don't know. In this form of the cosine law, you know all three sides, but the two sides that the angle is between are still together. It's plus b squared. It's plus c squared. The a squared is being subtracted. It's different. So let's take a look at this next example. Lions Gate Bridge is a suspension bridge, and it's strengthened by triangular braces. One brace has three lengths. So I've drawn a triangle here that has three different lengths. One of the lengths is 19. One of the lengths is 14. One of the lengths is 12.2. And the question is, what is this angle? So I, I don't, I've never really been comfortable with coming up a way, with a way to explain this. But do you see that this side and this side are B and C? They're the two sides that the angle is between, which is B and C. So this is B, this is C, and this is A, which makes the angle we're trying to find, angle A, which fits that other version of the cosine law. I can write cosine of A equals B squared plus C squared minus the A squared over 2 times B times C. And it's actually 12.2. So as a first step, I would like everybody to calculate what that whole thing is equal to before we take the inverse cosine. I get 0 0.6769. Now, anybody else get that? I can tell a lot of you didn't. I can tell by the expressions on your faces. And there's a lot going on in here. First of all, a very common mistake, we'll come back to that in a second, would be to say 19 squared plus 12.2 squared plus, no, sorry, minus 14 squared and then go divided by. Well, we need to put that whole thing in brackets if you're going to do it that way. So that's not going to work. So we can go back here and put brackets and then go divided by 2 times 19 times 12.2. That's wrong as well because what this is saying I think we've talked about this already someplace else in the course. What this is saying is take that 19 squared plus 12.2 squared minus 14 squared 
minus 14 squared divided by 2 times, even if you put this in brackets, you're going to be dividing it by 2, and then you're going to be multiplying by 19 and by 12.2. We want to divide by 2 times 12.2 times 19. So if, if you want to enter this into your calculator all in one fell swoop, which means all at once, then you also need a set of brackets around the denominator. Now, if you're wondering what I did, I did, because I'm a product of my education, I did this. I took 19 squared, and I added 12.2 squared, and I subtracted 14 squared. And when I was taught to use a calculator, we didn't have screens that you could look at. I mean, there were nice calculators. It wasn't like we were using a you know, abacus or counting stones or something. We, we had calculators. But we were taught to then hit equals and then divide by the other stuff. But when I'm dividing by a product, what that means is I have to divide by the 2, and I have to divide by the 19, and I have to divide by the 12.2. They're all on the bottom. I have to divide by all of them. Or I can go divided by and then put it in brackets. Anyway, we still have to take the inverse cosine of that. 0 0.67 is what the cosine is. So inverse cos of the answer gives us an angle of 47 degrees. That's the answer. Any questions with that example? OK, I'm going to change the lesson here. Uh, let's just talk about number four. I'm not even going to set up anything in number four. Number four says solve this triangle. So what that would mean is you would have to use, looking at this triangle, I hope you see you would have to use the cosine law to find the side across from there. Once you know that, you've opened up the door to use the sine law to find another angle. And once you know the other angle, well, then you can find the third angle by adding them up and taking them away from 180. If I say solve this triangle, and I think yours says 30 up top, right? Okay. You're going to use the cosine law to find an angle. Once you know an angle, you've opened the door to use the sine law to find anything else. You still with me? Okay. So we're not going to do that, but what I am going to do instead is I'm going to go back to number two. And remember when I said if you would have used the sine law to find A before we knew B, you would get the wrong answer? Let's look at what happens here if you use the cosine law to find that missing side C. And now, let's find angle A, which the sine law fails us on. Let's use the cosine law to find angle A. So in the cosine law, cosine of angle A equals, well, these are the two oddball sides that form angle A. So they're the ones that I'm going to square. It's the other one. I'm going to subtract, and then I have to divide by 2 times the 5 times the 6.5. And I'm going to take a minute to get that 6.5 on my calculator again. Um, how did we do that? We went sine of 20. Oh, we used the cosine law, 5, 11, and 20. 25 plus 121 minus... Uh, 110 cos 20. There was our side. So I'm going to use now the cosine law. Looking at the right-hand side, I'm going to have 5 squared, which is 25. Um, I'm going to have to do this in brackets to do it all in one shot. Don't worry about exactly why. Uh, plus the answer squared, so the 25 is the 5 squared, minus 11 squared, end bracket, divided by 2 times 5 times the answer. So I have 5 squared plus the answer squared, minus 11 squared over 2 times 5 times the answer. 
And when you do this, you think you've done something wrong because it's negative. But take the inverse cos of it. Whoops. The cosine law will give you an angle greater than 90. If the angle is greater than 90, it will never, ever let you down. The sine law has a big gaping hole in it that it fails when it comes to an ambiguous triangle. The cosine law, nothing's ambiguous about it. It will give you the answer. Okay. So I'm going to hand out your next assignment right now. I'm going to say a couple of things briefly about it. And then you're going to get to work on, well, the assignment and the cosine law problems. You are going to need for this assignment, which is due Monday, you are going to need a ruler and a protractor. And I'm going to be expecting a nice, not a nice, wrong word. I'm going to be expecting very precise work. You're going to be drawing a triangle and doing some measurements on the triangle. So your measurements have to be done well, precisely. I do have a bunch of protractors, so if you need a protractor to take home, I can set you up. I'm not going to walk you through each step of the assignment. It tells you in each part of the question what exactly you're supposed to do. And I don't want you to draw anything on the assignment until... I'm done with my explanation. What I would like you to do is look at the back page of the assignment. I'm going to pull up mine up here. Hope this is the one. Yep. So on the back page of your assignment is a map of Alberta. And on the front of the assignment it says, Choose two locations in Alberta, one that's in quadrant two and one that's in quadrant four. So I've drawn on here, or I've added on here the coordinate grid. You can see the axes. You need to pick something that's in this quadrant, the northeastern quadrant, and the southwestern quadrant. I don't want you to pick it yet. But what you are going to be doing What you were then asked to do is to draw a triangle showing a plane trip from Fort Chipewyan to the location in quadrant two and then to quadrant four. And you're going to be constructing a triangle. Where's Fort Chip? I made a mistake earlier when I say you're going to pick a, a position in the northeastern corner. That's not quadrant two, right? Because I was looking at it backwards in my head. No excuse. And let's say you pick La Crete and Stetler. You're going to be constructing a triangle on here. I'm not going to tell you exactly what needs to be done, but what I will tell you is... I think it's a very smart move to choose two places so that when you draw an accurate triangle, you know for sure none of the angles are more than 90. Because you're going to be asked to find some things using the sine law, and if you have an angle that's more than 90, even this, I mean, I can tell that angle up at La Crete is less than 90, but you know, maybe I want to choose an, a different location so I'm sure it's less than 90. Because if the angle ends up being 92 degrees, you're going to get 88 as an answer and it will be wrong. So what I'm suggesting to you, and my, di my triangle is not drawn very well, what I'm suggesting is make sure you're choosing something that without a doubt is going to give you an angle less than 90 degrees everywhere. 
If you don't, you may end up losing a whole bunch of marks because you don't know that it's more than 90 and the ambiguous case of the sign law punches you in the head. You're not aware of it. You wake up and go, oh, I got the question wrong. So that's due Monday. If you do need a protractor, um, I have a whole bunch of protractors here that you can, you can pick one up. I'm not going to hand them out. I'll just put some you know, in different places around the room. You can use to the rest of today's class to work on some of this assignment, but I really would prefer that you work on the cosine law. Okay. Tomorrow we're going to be reviewing, so you have some time tomorrow to work on the assignment as well. All right, uh, get to work. I need to take my attendance, do a couple of other quick things, and then I will be around to help you out.